Kathy, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, the talk. Um, Dr. Sandhouse gave me the honor of talking about the couple of uh, research studies that are currently ongoing at National Jewish Health regarding alpha-1 antitrypsin. And the three main ones I'm going to talk about is GRADS, uh, the other one is epigenetic regulation, and the last one is about a new one about hyaluronic acid inhalation in alpha-1 antitrypsin. So let's start out with GRADS. You know, as Kathy said, my main area of interest in research is sarcoidosis. So how did I jump the bridge from sarcoidosis to alpha-1, which both diseases have nothing in common between them? And that was through GRADS. Uh, and GRADS stands for Genomic Research in Alpha-1 Antitrypsin Deficiency and Sarcoidosis. This was a big study sponsored by the National Institute of Health. They combined two diseases that needed a big study, both sarcoidosis and alpha-1 deficiency. And my initial involvement was through sarcoidosis, but then as Dr. Sandhouse came on board and we added the alpha-1 protocol to our center, I got involved in both diseases. And as you can see, this was a countrywide study with multiple centers involved in it recruiting patients for this study. So what was this study? Now, we'll forget about the sarcoidosis part of the study and I'll focus on the alpha-1. So the aim of this study was a cross-sectional study, meaning they, we recruited patients at a one-time point and only at a one-time point. The patients did not come back for future visits. That's part of the study design uh, that the whole, um, all the centers reached uh, at. And the aim of it was to determine if patients with PIZZ uh, alpha-1 deficiency on augmentation uh, uh, therapy had a difference in their microbiome of their lungs. The microbiome is the bugs that live in our systems. So the microbiome now is becoming a really hot topic in medicine on how it regulates health, regulates the disease, regulates the immune system. You might have heard a lot of talk about the microbiome of the gut. You know, what lives in your bowels? How do they Im impact your health, your immune system? Well, in this study, the question came up is, what is the microbiome, the gut, or the, sorry, the lung flora in patients with alpha-1 antideficiency and deficiency and how did it differ between those with MZ versus ZZ on therapy versus ZZ not on therapy? In the past, we used to assume that the lung is a sterile environment. There's no bugs down there. There shouldn't be bugs down there. No bacteria, no viruses should be in the lungs. But some research has discovered that, no, there actually is some bacteria and viruses living, not causing infection, but just living there and potentially impacting the, the overall health of the lungs. So the goal of this study was to look at you know, the, this environment in alpha-1 patients. In addition to that, some centers had their own local uh, study looking at specific questions related to alpha-1 and to trypsin. And here's the boring details of the study. So it had four main aims to look at in alpha-1. The first one, as I said, was to compare the microbiome and the virome, the bacteria and the virus populations that live in the lung in patients not on therapy, patients on therapy, comparing them to MZs and comparing them also to MM individuals from another study that was looking at normal healthy controls. And also we were gonna look at whether the lung washings from these patients correlated to immune activity and activation of your immune system in the blood and how there's a correlation between the microbiome in the lung and immune activation in the blood. We also try to look at correlation between radiographic changes uh, on a CAT scan and whether that correlates with the microbiome. Um, you know, do some bacteria cause worse disease than the other? And that was another aim for it. And also we were trying to look for new molecular phenotypes, basically blood tests, looking at proteins, look, looking at different markers that may give us an idea up front whether, you know, which patient is going to go uh, lose lung function faster than the other so we can gear our intervention based on that. So a lot of questions uh, based on this study. 
The inclusion criteria mainly were people aged between 35 to 80. They had to have ZZ or MZ. Um, the ZZs could have been on therapy or off of therapy. We were looking for both. Uh, clearly, patients had to be able to consent and willing to undergo the study procedures, and they had to sign an informed consent. The exclusion criteria was a very long list uh, of exclusion criteria. It was basically anybody with active infections were excluded. Anybody who was too sick to participate in the study, they couldn't undergo the procedure, and I'll tell you what that was in a minute. <clears throat> Those were, patients were excluded. And they mainly were exclusion for safety reasons more than anything else. And the patients came on a two-day visit study. On day one, we reviewed the study procedures, signed an informed consent, did vital signs, underwent pulmonary function tests, CAT scan, six-minute walk test, blood sample collection, urine sample collection, a stool sample collection was obtained on the second day, and that was to compare the microbiome, the bacteria between the gut and the lungs, a number of questions, and then the research bronchoscopy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So a good assessment of the extent and the severity of their lung disease so that later on we can look at patients with good disease and bad disease and see whether there's differences between them on immune responses and whether the microbiome looked different between these folks. And when, again, we did a lot of questionnaires on these patients to assess you know, the severity of their disease, the impact of the disease on their quality of life, the impact of the disease on their perception of shortness of breath and how much they can do. And we recruited, the goal was to recruit 150 patients. We fell short slightly, recruited 139, which is, as a percentage, is not too bad compared to you know, your target enrollment in studies like this. 60% uh, of our patients were males, 40% were females, and the average age was 56 year, uh, years. We had roughly uh, a third of those were ZZs off of therapy, a third were ZZ on therapy, and a third were MZs. The MM folks, which are basically normal healthy controls, we got their, their information from another study that was conducting lung washings and looking at their microbiome. So instead of doubling up on the same patients and spending the money on recruiting the same patients, we collaborated with another study, the Spiromic study, to use their data from those folks. And right now, where is this project? So the current status of the project is all the clinical data has, is being analyzed right now, and the results of the clinical description of the patients, are uh, the, the papers are being written to be published. The biosamples, all the samples we got, the lung washings, the blood, everything that was analyzed, is right now has been completed analysis, and right now the groups are looking at that data so that they can start you know, deciphering the results looking at the uh, patients with ZZs and MZs and comparing them and looking for those differences that uh, the study aimed to look at. And the other thing is all the samples went into a biorepository, basically like a, a bank for samples, where these samples are going to be available and are currently being distributed out to researchers who are interested in looking at alpha-1 research but have different questions from what this study looked at. So now we've got a bank of samples from blood, we've got a bank of samples from lung washings that are being distributed out to researchers. Uh, part of them is Dr. Uh, Petraki, who spoke recently. She's getting some of these samples also to conduct more research beyond the scope of grads. Um, right now also there's one paper out on this project which is uh, describing the procedures, what samples were obtained, and if you keep an eye out, if you're the kind that looks out for research studies, keep an eye out for the word grads, and just make sure you look at the alpha-1 protocol because there's gonna be two published, the alpha-1 and the sarcoidosis, and you'll start in the next year seeing a lot of papers coming out describing the results from this study. <clears throat> now, the good thing about this study is as we were recruiting the patients and obtaining samples, we began to look at something on the side which led to us having funding for this study, which is epigenetic regulation of immunity in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And this is a study that's currently enrolling patients uh, into the study. So the goals of the uh, study, I'm thinking she might have loaded up the wrong 
talk here, but I'll, uh, if it is, I'll, I'll, I'll switch it out at the end. Now, as we know, there's, variable, there's a variable natural course for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Not everybody who has alpha-1 ZZ follows the same course. Some people have milder disease, some people have moderate disease, and some people have much faster deterioration of their uh, lung function. And the question is why? You know, part of it we know if you smoke, you're more likely to lose function faster. But even patients who don't smoke, or even the patients who smoke the same amount, the rate of lung decline is different from one person to the other. So the question is, why does that happen? And part of it is we know that there's a strong environmental exposure, not just cigarette smoking, but to other things environment, maybe bad air quality, but there might be other things out there, you know, whether you get infections or not, what kind of infections. <clears throat> so environmental exposures work through something called epigenetic mechanisms, and I'll explain that in a minute. And that these mechanisms may modify how fast alpha-1 impacts your lung function. <clears throat> and as I said, this is a study that rose out of grads. We took some samples from alpha-1 patients who were participated in grads, the previous study, and we ran, look, looked at some of their epigenetic markers. And we found some, noticed some differences, and we submitted the grant to the National Institute of Health and saying, hey, we're, we're seeing some differences here you know, we'd like to look at this in a larger, bigger population. And <clears throat> luckily, we did get the money, and we were uh, able to uh, start another study looking at alpha-1, an epigenetic study. So what does this mean? So what is epigenetics? Now, we all know that we have DNA, <clears throat> which controls everything in our body. You know, what we look like, the color of our hair, the color of our eyes, <clears throat> the proteins we uh, produce and that function differently in our body. Well, al alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a defect in your DNA. You don't produce enough of the uh, alpha-1 protein. Now, there are elements or proteins that are attached to our DNA, and they regulate whether part of a DNA or gene is expressed, is turned into protein or not. So it's like a, a stop, stoplight. It either says, go ahead and transcribe this and make protein, or no, don't make it so nothing is produced. <clears throat> so they regulate DNA expression. And these epigenetic elements are controlled or affected by what we are exposed to in the environment. So you've heard about in the news and in, in, uh, on the internet is what your mother ate could impact what happens to you down the road. Or what your mother did in, in, while she was pregnant with you might impact you know, what happens to you down the road. That is all happens through epigenetics. What your mother is exposed to, what she ate, potential infections she had, <clears throat> impact these epigenetic molecules on your DNA and on the long term impact what happens to you, to you. So we are looking at these variation in these epigenetics between alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, patients, those with good disease and bad disease. But we're really what we're focusing on here is looking at patients before they start uh, augmentation therapy and after aug they're on augmentation therapy. Uh, so what we are doing here is recruiting patients, alpha-1 ZZ patients, who are going to be starting augmentation therapy but yet have not started it. They're getting into the study. We're looking at their lung environment. We're looking at their epigenetics. <clears throat> and then they go on. So we get a baseline for their disease. And then they go on to augmentation therapy. And six months after augmentation therapy, we reassess them again. And we see what does augmentation therapy impact their gene expression and their uh, epigenetic markers. So we can better understand how that impacts inflammation in the body from alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And having a better understanding will help us potentially determine whether some novel treatments out there may impact uh, their disease. So how is the study being conducted? As I said, we are focusing on alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, ZZ. We're not looking at MZs because, as you've heard, MZs typically do not or should not be getting augmentation therapy. So we're looking, looking at ZZ patients who are currently not on augmentation therapy but will be starting. So your doctor said you need to get on therapy and that time window between they say you need to get on therapy 
and you actually get the first infusion, that's the window when we, we're going to recruit those patients. <clears throat> They'll undergo a bronchoscopy and a lung wash before starting therapy and six months after therapy. So <clears throat> how many of you had a lung wash or a bronchoscopy with a lung wash? So not much of alpha-1 patients go through this process. And let me just tell you what, what happens and why we do this procedure as part of this study. So a, a bronchoscopy with a lung wash is basically a scope down into the lungs and we put fluid down part of the lung and suck it back out again so we can get those cells out of the lung and look at these epigenetic markers and the gene expression that I talked about. So basically, patients come in, get an IV, and they're sedated like you're having a colonoscopy, for example. And then we numb up their nose and throat and a scope that's not too thick, you know, not much thicker than maybe the oxygen tubes that you see. <clears throat> and we go down the nose into the lungs and into one part of the lung, we push a bunch of fluid in, not, too, not a lot, but enough to float those cells up, and then we suck them back out again. And now we get those cells that are living in the lungs of the patients and take them up to the lab to anal analyze them. And we analyze their epigenetic markers. We look at their whole DNA, and we look at certain markers, and we look at these epigenetics, what are switched on and what are switched off. Then these patients, end up going on therapy, and we repeat the procedure six months down, and now we look at it and say, okay, what was off and now is on, and what was the opposite? And that's most likely the impact of the augmentation therapy. And did augmentation therapy really switch off a lot of the inflammation genes in the lungs or not? And if it didn't, which ones are left on, and can we turn those off with other medicines that impact epigenetics? Just to mention also, the bronchoscopy procedure is an outpatient procedure. Patients come in, they get it done, a couple hours, they go home. Um, minimal uh, impact on the rest of their day, and the next morning, they're back to their normal selves. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, the bronchoscopy is an essential tool to obtain samples from the site. And as you can see here, you know, the scope goes down the nose into the lungs right here, and in one part of the lung, we wash part of the lung, it floats the cells, and then we suck it back out again. We don't wash, wash the whole lung out. We just wash one subsegment of the lung. So patients, when they wake up, you know, they just cough a little bit, maybe have a little bit of fever the rest of the day, but usually their oxygen requirements are the same. They go home and they feel fine, just a little bit run down from the sedation itself. Uh, as I said, it's an outpatient procedure, and recovery time is about one to two hours. And it's a, pr a pretty routine procedure. Uh, almost all of the alpha-1 patients who participated in grads underwent the bronchoscopy procedure. And it was through this that we could sample what's deep in their lungs to analyze what might be living deep in their lungs to figure out the microbiome and the virome that we talked about. And as I said, we are currently recruiting subjects with PIZZ not on therapy, but will be starting therapy. And if anybody's interested in, fits this category, is interested in knowing more about the study, or you'd like to share it with uh, other patients back home, there's going to be flyers uh, on the Alpha One table outside that you can pick up. <clears throat> now to the last study that we have currently active at National Jewish Health, which is a treatment study. Uh, it's sponsored by one of the drug companies. It's really looking at a hyaluronic acid inhalation solution as a treatment for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The rest of the words there is basically describing the kind of study it is. It's randomized, meaning if you participate, you may get the real thing or you may get uh, just salt water, the placebo. Oops, sorry. Double-blinded means neither the patient nor the researchers know what you've been assigned to until the end of the study, until everybody's been through the study, then we break the codes so that we can analyze the data. Uh, as I said, placebo-controlled, meaning half the patients usually take the real drug and half will take placebo. Sometimes it's two to one, three to one, depending on the design they want to do. Multiple dosing, meaning they're looking, it's not a fixed dose, they're looking to figure out which doses work better. for. Uh, and proof of concept, meaning this is an early study. You know, they haven't done anything like this in humans before. That's why it's a multiple dose proof of concept looking for these 
uh, the impact of this uh, intervention. So the goal of this study is to look at the efficacy and safety of this compound, and I'll talk more about what it is, uh, in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and it's an inhalation solution. So basically, it's a nebulization that you, they take twice a day. Also, part of the study is to look at novel markers to determine uh, treatment efficacy. The problem with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is you take a treatment. Right now, it's augmentation therapy, right? But it's not, a, uh, it's not a treatment that you're going to feel better two hours or one day or a week after you take it. It's not like a pneumonia or an infection that you take a course of anti antibiotics and you quickly feel better. And as all of you know, the goal of augmentation therapy or any therapy in alpha-1 is to slow down the decline in, or the, the fast decline in lung function. So patients don't suddenly feel much better or regain lung function quickly after they receive augmentation therapy. The same thing applies to this therapy or any other therapy. So to figure out whether it's working, sometimes it might take months to notice a difference that the decline is slowing down, or it requires patients undergoing CAT scans on a regular basis to measure the amount of emphysema. So finding out new markers to see if the treatment works or not is a good thing because if this marker correlates with, with a a decline in how fast the lung goes down, then we can measure these markers and know in much faster and a shorter time period whether a new therapy is effective or not. So you can get through studies faster and these drugs can be approved much faster than going through one or two years of study before you say, yes, this, this drug works. So they're looking at sputum blood and urine concentration of two markers, one's called desmosine and one's called isodesmosine, and these are both basically markers of tissue breakdown, which is what happens in emphysema. There's been studies showing that these markers are high in patients with emphysema, including alpha-1. And if we can slow down the breakdown of tissue, then these markers or the levels of these markers should go down in the blood or urine. So part of the study is they're going to try to assess whether these markers are potentially good markers to assess whether a drug works or not. And also, they're going to look at a new technique for CT scanning called functional respiratory imaging to see whether that's also a good way to figure out if, if a drug is working to slow down lung destruction or not. So in addition to a new therapy, there might be some additional benefits from this study, new ways to assess therapies. So what is hyaluronic acid? So hyaluronic acid is naturally found in our body. This is not a novel compound. It's not a synthetic compound from outside. But it's found in the extracellular matrix of the lungs and the other tissue. So what is extracellular matrix? If you think of any organ, it's made out of cells, which either line a certain organ or made up of the organ. But then you've got everything else that makes up that organ. It's like the scaffolding of the lung or the scaffolding of the liver. And that's where all the cells attach to and hold on to. So another way to look at it, it's the gel on which cells sit or the, or the fibrous tissue of your lungs sit in or glued together through it, all right? And the main one is elastin and collagen. And really what happens in alpha-1 and emphysema is patients lose, elastin is degraded down and collagen is broken up. And these two are, are embedded in this hyaluronic acid, which is the gel. So why are they thinking about using this? In animal experiments, using it in mice and other animals that were models for emphysema, they found that giving them additional hyaluronic acid was protective against elastase injury and was important in stabilizing the extracellular matrix and, in, and slowed down or promoted tissue growth and repair. So in animal models, giving them hyaluronic acid, this gel that holds the, the, the organs together, was shown to preserve and prevent faster damage to the matrix and the collagen and the elastin, which is typically broken down in, in emphysema. And it's also shown to maybe promote tissue growth and repair. Maybe if you provide more gel, some of that will repair, come back in. Now, I can tell you from animal experiments, you know, a lot of it works in, in uh, animals. 
interventions, they work in animals, but translating it in humans, unfortunately, a lot of it fails. So you can't simply take it from an animal and give it as a treatment option. You still have to do studies in humans to see whether that translates there or not. But that's the basics of try, trying this compound, is trying to replace the gel of the lung, which is known to protect, protect it from destruction. And then I, this is what I already said, which is why use it, is because elastic fiber scaffolding on the lung is broken down in emphysema and trying to protect it from this breakdown. It also binds to the elastic fibers in the lung and prevents elastases. And that's what alpha-1 in the body does. It counteracts the neutrophil elastases. And so it's a, it's a balance between a compound elastases that try to degrade some of these elastin in the body and between the natural compound which alpha-1 is missing is the, is the alpha-1. So now you've got more degradation than there is anti-degradation. So, so HA, hyaluronic acid, uh, tries to prevent that. And they, they presume there's some other mechanisms that are less clear. They may stabilize the air sacs uh, in the lung, so preventing their degradation and rupture. They may allow more hydration of the elastic fibers, giving them more uh, fluid, which improves their elastic properties so they're not dry and solid. Uh, and may also improve the mechanical forces throughout their lungs. So again, there's maybe more benefit to this compound than what is thought from the initial studies. So the study is going to administer the aer aerosolized, again, nebulized hyaluronic acid uh, to the patients. And this may become the first therapy that can alter the degenerative course of emphysema by preserving uh, and possibly restoring lung function. Again, we won't know if this is true or not until the study is completed and the results are available. So what will the patients or the, uh, who participate in this study undergo? Anybody who participates will have a single dose of study on day one, and then they'll spend about a four-hour observation in the research area just to make sure they don't have any adverse events or side effects from the first inhalation. You don't want to give somebody a new compound and then send them home within 10 minutes and something may happen to them on the ride home. So they'll be observed for four hours after the initial inhalation. But if they do fine, they'll discharge home, they'll take all the components they need, which is a nebulizer compressor and the study drug. And remember, you could get the real drug or you can get the placebo. We won't know. And you'll inhale it, nebulize it twice a day. You'll have follow-up visits either in clinic or by phone. And every two weeks for the first month, you'll come back in, and then every month after that to assess whether you're having side effects, are you doing fine, are you noticing any problems with the, with the procedure. More telephone consultations, there are a lot of contact between the research center and uh, the patients. And then on day 90, study drug will be discontinued, and then they'll follow the patients for seven days after that making sure there's no delayed effect from the drug. Now again, this is not a study just done at National Jewish, it's a multi-center study. So if some of you are not from the Colorado area, you, you might want to look up the study to see if there's a center closer to home if, you, if you're interested in participating. So who can participate in this study? Age 35 to 80, you have to have emphysema diagnosed uh, based on the gold criteria, stage one, two, or three. These are based on your pulmonary function test numbers. You have to have evidence on emphysema on a chest x-ray. There are certain lung function parameters that the study set that patients have to meet. I didn't put them in here to bore you with all the numbers, but they're not looking for people with supernormal lung function, and they also don't want people with the worst lung function. They're looking some people in the middle range. You know, people will undergo lab testing, different ones. Uh, clearly, you have to have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's what they're studying. And you have to have a sputum level of this compound of at least 10 nanograms per gram of protein because they're looking for a high level that's going to dip with therapy. If somebody comes in with a low level, you're not going to notice a dip. So they decided to exclude those patients. 
And the study status, as I said, is currently enrolling and it's open for enrollment. So you can't. These, these are patients who are off of augmentation, either haven't started. Now, some of these studies, like the first one that I talked about that involves the scope, and potentially this one too, if somebody discontinued augmentation therapy for whatever reason and has been off of it for a, a number of months, they might be eligible for some of these studies. Now, the first one that I talked about that involves a scope, the patient should be going back on augmentation therapy to participate in the study. So, you know, if you got off augmentation therapy for whatever reason and are not going to go back on it, you may not be eligible for the first study, but this one. Yeah, but that's where the long, detailed inclusion, exclusion criteria goes in and is if somebody came off of therapy, how long do they need to be off before they're eligible to come in? All right. So if you're interested in other studies, you know, I would encourage you to look at the research registry for Alpha 1, which is alpha one registry.org, they will list a lot of the studies out there that are recruiting patients for Alpha-1 studies, not just at National Jewish or in Denver, but across the country in general. And just to give you a glimpse of some of these studies, again, you guys have heard already, this is not a purely lung disease. Liver can be affected by this disease. So there's an adult liver study, which is fun, uh, it's a foundation-sponsored study looking at uh, clinical and genetic linkage studies to learn more about the natural history of liver disease in alpha-1 patients. It's open to ZZ alpha patients. There's a one in Florida at the University of Florida right now. They're looking for patients with and without evidence of liver disease, and they're going to follow them for about three years. So this sounds like a more of a natural history stu uh, study trying to figure out what happens with patients with liver disease. And then there's another one, it's a liver drug study at, at Pittsburgh in Washington, looking at a new treatment for severe liver disease in alpha-1 antitrypsin. The drug is called carbamazepine. This is not a new drug, it's out there, but they're trying to find a new indication for it. And they're trying to see whether this drug can prevent or reverse scarring from alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Again, these will be all on the alpha-1 registry website if you're interested. Lung studies. And now again, they're looking at another drug called, the, uh, drug called Alpha-1 MP to discover if, whether it's safe and effective in slowing down the progression of lung damage in alpha studies. They'll be looking at two different doses of the study as well as a placebo over a three-year period. Again, multiple centers are recruiting, so if you're not, uh, look it up, see if you're interested, whether you meet the criteria and whether there's a center close to you for convenience. Now, sometimes some of these studies will compensate for travel, so if you have to drive two hours, four hours, spend a day in a hotel, some of these uh, studies will compensate for, the, for travel expenses. An MZ study, they're looking at why some MZ carriers develop COPD and others not. Again, this emphasizes the whole, not everybody's the same, not everybody's on the same trajectory. Whether some of these MZ carriers may have epigenetic problems that speed up their disease and some don't, um, this, this study is trying to look at these differences. And the MPROV is another one looking at advanced emphysema. And this is really an interventional study where they're trying to look at the one-way valve put in by a bronchoscope leads to improvement in lung function. This one I can tell you on regular COPD, there's been a lot of studies on these valves which are put in the lung itself. So again, through that scope that I showed, the bronchoscope, they go in, they look at which is the worst part of the lung, worst destroyed part of the lung in the patient. And what they do is they take the airway leading to that most destroyed part of the lung that really is not doing much to your lung function. You know, it's really destroyed and it's not contributing to gas exchange. So they find out based on CAT scan which part of the lungs, they go in with the scope and it's a one-way valve that they put in the airway. What that does is allows the air to come out but doesn't allow the air to go in. So what happens to that part of the lung is it collapses. So now it's not participating in gas exchange. Well, in the first place it wasn't. But it was occupying a big chunk of your chest cavity. And now you deflate it so your muscles go back into a more relaxed position for breathing. There's been a lot of studies on these valves being done in regular COPD patients, not alpha-1 patients. And they've noticed that patients feel better. Their lung function improves because 
the muscles are in a better position to breathe. So now they want to extend these studies into alpha-1 uh, patients. Again, they're looking for severe emphysema patients. Uh, and they, again, they're trying to see if what we see in COPD translates into uh, alpha-1 patients. If you've heard about lung volume reduction surgery, where they used to, there's a specific surgery where they go in and they cut out the worst part of the lung, the most destroyed. Uh, this is a non-surgical technique to do the same, but without cutting into the patient. Uh, so some patients who may not be eligible for lung volume reduction may eligible, be eligible for this uh, valve procedure. Again, there's another study looking at inflammation and macrophages. Again, macrophages are the resident cells of the lungs. They're like the police for the immune system. And they're here, again, they're combining alpha-1 and cystic fibrosis and looking to see whether manipulating macrophages can decrease inflammation. This is similar to what we're doing with the epigenetic study. We're looking at macrophages and whether we can tell them to quieten down and stop creating a lot of inflammation in the lungs of alpha-1 patients. Another one's looking at six-minute walk test. And then there's a Pelican trial is looking at more at improving quality of life using oxygen. So they're looking at oxygen supplementation and its impact on disease. So you've got really involved studies where patients may be undergoing bronchoscopies, novel therapies, and you've got somewhat less involved studies where six-minute walk tests and oxygen therapy. So a lot of studies going on, but more resources. Again, as I said, you can look at the Alpha-1 registry uh, under the current studies tab and look at what studies they have going on right now. And the other good source is this one, clinicaltrials.gov. Any research study that involves recruiting human subjects, no matter what, the researchers have to register their study on, uh, on this website. If they don't, they can't conduct their study. They can't publish their study. So if there's any study out there looking at alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and requires patient recruitment, involvement, it will be re registered here. Go to this website, under the search tab, enter alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and there's a box that says only open studies. So if you're interested in looking at open studies that you might participate, click the open study, otherwise you'll get like 10 pages of them and it'll take you a while to get through them. So do only open studies, and it lists all the studies that are currently open and recruiting patients. And you can click through them, and it will tell you what the study is about, what is it looking for, what's the patient's involvement, what are the criteria for involvement. And at the bottom, it will tell you the centers and their contact information if you're interested. And again, if you live outside Colorado, you can see if there's a center close to you or not. If you're interested in knowing everything about what's going on in Alpha 1, don't click this and it'll give you all studies that are open, completed. Some of the completed, they may have a link to the results. And it'll also include studies that are coming but not open yet. So you may be eligible for a study that will start in the next few months, and it'll show up as uh, pending. Okay? Questions? And I continue, a lot of these studies are extremely important to move the field uh, forward. Um, in, asthma pay, in asthma research, I mean, there's a lot of asthma models for mice and animals, and I can tell you any intervention in them cures the mice. But the percentage of those interventions that actually are work in humans and make it to, uh, you know, to patients is a very small percentage. So uh, patient-based research is extremely important to advance the knowledge and to, and to introduce novel therapies. And although we do have augmentation therapy, all of you know it's not the magic bullet yet. And there are other potential therapies out there that might be complementary, alternative. We don't know yet until we do the uh, research. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Well, there was the one that I listed there that they're looking at. Um, I don't know. There's, off the top of my, my, I don't know any of them right now. But if there is, they should be on the Alpha One registry, and they definitely should be on the clinicaltrials.gov. Even if it's a natural history registry, basically they just want you to register and follow along, it should be listed there.